So good morning, afternoon, evening to you all. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying all the sessions of the General Stewards Meeting thus far. I'm Raquel Ferreira from the Gift Coordination Team. Welcome everyone to the session on public participation, presenting the latest gift network developments on public participation in fiscal policies. This is a very important session, uh, given that it was the most popular topic that the gift stewards indicated in the pre-meeting survey that they actually wanted a session on. We thus hope you find uh, the agenda very enlightening and that it fulfills all your expectations in this regard. We're gonna have two of these sessions for language translation purposes today the translation will be available in English Spanish, and tomorrow it's going to be available in English French. Participants will be speaking in the language of their preferences, such that French-speaking countries are more likely to give us their updates at tomorrow's meeting. Please use the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen, um, slightly to the right, to select your language of preference. Special welcome to all of our distinguished presenters today that have a wealth of knowledge on this topic. So first up, setting the scene is Shruti Bandyopaye, I hope I've pronounced that right, from the World Bank Group that will present the latest global developments on public participation. This presentation is based on a very interesting paper called Mainstreaming Citizen Engagement in public finance management for better results that Shruti co-authored. We are going to um, share a link to this paper uh, and we encourage you all to read it as it comes with a wealth of information and knowledge. It is very rich with information on the identification of suitable approaches and the tools that can be used for public participation in the different stages of the public financial management cycle and stresses that knowing the purposes of the engagement, so why are you entering into public participation in the first place, why are you undertaking these initiatives, as well as the contextual factors relevant to each situation and to each country are key to the success of these initiatives. Um, so we can't wait to hear more on that. This is followed by two very practical examples from two countries, that is Brazil and Sierra Leone, that have successfully implemented uh, public participation initiatives. Daniel Avellino from the Institute of Applied Economic Research will uh, present the Brazilian example. From Sierra Leone, we have Abu Bakar Kamara from the Budget Ad Advocacy Network and Matthew Dingy from the Ministry of Finance who will together bring us a very rich presentation. After these, uh, we have brief updates from the countries that are currently undertaking initiatives on the status of these initiatives, what they have learned thus far, and importantly, what challenges they are facing. Um, it's often from challenges that we learn how to move forward and that peer learning can take place. Five of these countries are actually taking play, uh, part in the Fiscal uh, Openness Accelerator Project, which is a gift IB, IBP project supporting the development of tailored design mechanisms of public participation along the budget cycle. Each mechanism of participation will be specifically developed by each country and specifically tailored for their needs. So it's, we don't have a one size fits all. We want to tailor what the needs are um, such that the initiatives actually have a greater chance of working at the end of the day. The participant countries are receiving technical assistance in the design, monitoring and documentation of these cases phase by phase and in synthesis of knowledge to facilitate this progress. The technical assistance will provide insights and lessons learned on best practices and experiences from other countries, notably through peer exchange amongst these particular countries themselves. 
thereby assisting governments in identifying their particular next steps. In this regard, a very special word of gratitude to the US Department of State's Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs that with others like the World Bank's OGP multi-donor trust fund are supporting this very important work, um, the initiative. We will get updates from six countries, that is from Chile, uh, from South Africa, Nigeria, Liberia, and Senegal and Benin, although it's likely that those we will get in the French speaking session um, tomorrow. The format of this session is that we want to make it as interactive as possible. So we're providing for the presentations at the beginning and then for engagement with these presentations in the form of Q&A and a breakout session. Uh, we were having some technical difficulties with the breakout session, but we hope those will be resolved soon um, such, such that those can take place at, towards the end of the session. Um, we hope in the Q&A we'll be able to provide for peer-to-peer -peer engagement, um, learning on public participation initiatives that people are currently undertaking, motivating some of us that have not yet started to get started on these initiatives, and assisting those that are currently undertaking these initiatives to formulate ideas, brainstorm with them, and overcome challenges. In the breakout sessions, we're going to ask stewards to discuss amongst themselves the challenges they are facing on initiating public participation initiatives in their country, if they have not done so already, trying to what challenges they are facing and identifying the objective. So it's key when entering into public participation that it's clear what we want to get out of um, the process. Then also, how do we identify um, planning of the interventions? How do we do it? When do we do it? Um, and finally, what are the lessons that we can learn from others so that we don't repeat uh, mistakes that have been done with others? And also, we can all uh, together put together our ideas for overcoming the challenges. So thus, we have quite a full, rich agenda ahead of us. Um, so I don't want to delay any further and without further ado, I'm going to pass the floor to Shruti. There will be Q&A um, in her session, um, in her presentation, so please note down any questions that uh, you may have as she's presenting and there will be that opportunity as soon as she's done. Uh, please go ahead, um, Shruti. Thank you. Um, Albertina, please share the presentation. Oh, I'll do so. Ah, great, thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you, thank you, Albertina. And I, again, I am sorry uh, for being a few minutes late. Um, on behalf of my co-authors, um, uh, Saki, Helen, and myself, I just want to thank GIFT for inviting me to uh, to, to present this and this is as part of the note that uh, we have uh, written and um, please let me know if there is any difficulty in accessing the note. I'll be more than happy to uh, have a discussion on it and share the link, um, etc. We look forward to, to, to have a discussion on, on this note. Um, Albertine, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, uh, mainstreaming citizen engagement has been part of a uh, World Bank agenda for some time now. And uh, to understand that better, how it works, what does it mean in, in, in re real terms on the field, um, World Bank's uh, governance global practice has, uh, um, has undertaken last year a few of these kind of notes where we are, we, we are not actually doing a lot of field visit or, um, or going actually and talking to the, talking to the um, uh, ministries, but we are actually doing DEX-based research to understand uh, that what some of the incentive, what motivates um, governments to implement citizen engagement in PFM 
what are some of the challenges and most importantly how they have been done in in, in practical life um, so um, uh, so that that's basically one of the purpose for writing this note for us uh, next slide please Um, 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 here, I very quickly, I just want to give some of the context and uh, some of the some of the framework that we have developed that what is mainstreaming citizen engagement, how, uh, how can we develop the uh, framework uh, to, to, to discuss this. For us, there are four pillars to it or four steps. The first step is just to inform some of the citizen engagement in PFM as well. This follows the same pattern that some of these initiatives are just to inform public, inform citizen. So one is little, next is little bit, a next step where we are actually consulting. It's basically a two way communication. The third step, which is a really a bigger one, it's basically when you are collaborating, which is very different from inform and consult, and then you are actually empowering. Um, citizen, uh, uh, participatory budgeting is empowering. And, uh, in, uh, and then just uh, publishing citi one citizen budget, just pushing it on, onto your website where you are just informing. So while we are discussing, we feel that it's very important to keep this framework in our mind and for the policymakers also that what we actually want to do. Uh, do, do we actually want to inform? Do you actually consult? It's a, like a two-way communication. Uh, South Korea is doing very well on this. Do you want to collaborate? Uh, and and do, if, if, do you actually want to empower? Um, next slide, please. And in here, what uh, we are looking at is some of the evidence, because as you, all of you have been doing this for many, many, many years, um, and then we know that uh, every time the, the, the conversation comes, what happens? What is the evidence of doing it? Does, does it increase my cost, uh, my tax collection, if I actually uh, invite citizen to be part of this uh, PFM process? What is this evidence? And even within the bank, this discussion is very, uh, very uh, prominent uh, that why do we even mainstream citizen give us this evidence? So this is something that we actually worked on on our paper. And um, uh, international initiatives, we cited GIFT a lot because GIFT has been doing such a tremendously important work in this field and, and some of the standards. And then also we talked about World, World Bank support on PFM. Um, because uh, one of our target audience is what we call our bank task teams for them when they are uh, helping uh, pol uh, policymakers in the government how actually uh, we are doing it so that's basically I just want to lay down the framework within which I am presenting today next slide please Um, we have for the purpose of our um, uh, to give some framework and, and to elaborate all these examples better, we have uh, take uh, we, we are working on these four phases um, on PFM and for each phase we started we we started talk we will talk about in this presentation as well as in the note that what are uh, what are some of the mechanisms on each step because each step the, uh, the purpose of each step is different. Uh, Therefore, there are many different mechanisms or so to say entry points on how government can actually invite uh, a citizen to participate in this process. So we are starting with fiscal law and policy design and then for budget formulation, enactment, implementation and external security. Uh, uh, in our mind, uh, fiscal law and policy design, it doesn't happen every year. It's not an yearly process. It happens when government is coming up with a new law or regulation or policy related to fiscal affairs. And that's the time 
uh, in many countries, they actually consult citizen uh, or on, on that particular aspect of it. But formulation, uh, enactment, um, uh, implementation and security, since these are yearly processes, so there are lots of scopes and entry points for uh, citizen to be uh, involved in this process. Also, we really wanted to um, highlight that th there are few major players. Um, budget, say, for example, budget enactment is essentially a parliamentary process. And parliaments, parliamentary budget offices, they are the leaders in this. Whereas uh, for the scrutiny, for the audit, it's the auditor general. So when we are talking about who is initiating this uh, public participation in budget process, it's not always government. Also, as we all know, that government uh, itself is not a monolithic organization. What part of government, when we are talking about budget formulation, many times it's the, um, it's the local government that has done tremendously well in, in uh, initiating participatory budgeting. Um, so very important for us when we are talking about PFM cycle and citizen engagement, it's very important to know who are the key players, who are leading this effort and who are inviting uh, citizen engagement in the budget process. Um, some of the principles of PFM that we wanted to highlight and then why are we doing it? When we are formulating this policy um, for citizen engagement, uh, these are some of the principles we wanted to highlight. Uh, transparency, it's, it's, it's not, um, there is a big debate that, um, and we agree that transparency is not equal to participation, but it's very, very important first step and a necessary uh, condition for, for, for uh, citizen engagement in PFM cycle. So we've highlighted a lot that some of the transparency initiative, how those initiatives are actually helping pu public participation, accessibility, um, in what form those uh, public participations are happening, very, very important. Uh, what language they are using, women, uh, how are they participating? Uh, so that, that brings us to the inclusivity, timeliness. It's very important when we are doing it because if uh, citizens are um, uh, extremely busy, if they think that that's my, my uh, two cent or, or CSOs or think tanks, what I'm doing, it's not going to affect the actual process because it's too late in the process it's not going to work uh, multiple engagement challenge in today's world how are these um, uh, agencies who are inviting citizen participation how are they using social media and and, and other technology to re to reach to the far uh, to the people who are actually not uh, not physically cannot be present to give feedback etc uh, sustainability and scale. Is it led by one, uh, one policymaker who has a great political will and that person retires and then the entire uh, uh, citizen engagement efforts goes, goes for a toss? Happens all the time. So it's very important for having that sustainability and scale. And then uh, uh, this closing the feedback loop, just up, uh, just pushing or just publishing that citizen budget on the website is not citizen engagement. Uh, getting feedback on some of those, uh, some of the topics that are discussed in the citizen budget, the allocation, etc. Close, get, having that conversation around it. So closing that food food back loop and government ownership. Is it a think tank or an international INGO that's leading it? Is it World Bank or IMF that's pushing it? Um, uh, who, government ownership as, at the end and, and reciprocity. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, here, very quickly, we wanted to um, give again some framework, as I said, in form. Um, uh, what is the, po at this point, at, through this graph, we wanted uh, our bank uh, task team leaders and for our government counterparts to actually think before, what are we talking about? Um, what is the purpose of it? Uh, because it's very important that uh, where are we as a government? Are we ready for, to just to inform? 
Are we ready to consult? Are we ready to collaborate or empower? Um, it, uh, we have provided this, um, um, this table just so that, uh, the, and, and some of the mechanism, just to, just to help policymakers think through that this is where I am, st at, at this stage I am in, this is where my country or my government is, uh, and this is what we can do. Uh, um, uh, no need to be over ambitious, uh, uh, always a good starting point point is where you are and then figuring out what are some of the mechanisms where, where you are in this process and how to actually do it. And I'll quickly go into some of the examples now. Next slide, please. Um, this is something that we have done in Cameroon. Um, here, um, why I have put this uh, uh, put this uh, slide up here because this notion of just disclosing, uh, if, if you can see the second step, just disclosing in a, a budget is not citizen participation. If you are simplifying and how you are disseminating your citizen budget, what are the channels that you are using? It's so important. Important, uh, and we kept on coming back to this point to make people, uh, policymakers, and our uh, bank colleagues aware that uh, you simplify through citizen budget, and then how much you are disseminating. Are you tracking who is analyzing this? Are the think tanks, CSOs, CBOs, actually analyzing this? What, what are the form of discussion that's happening? And what are the feedback that the, you, they are providing, and how they are using it? So in Cameroon, um, you can see in the left side with all this, uh, we have actually followed this entire process. It can be done at the national level, though we have uh, done in some of the districts, but this is how this entire process of uh, uh, moving beyond transparency should look like. And we have seen that increased tax revenue for local councils, changes in the willingness of parents to contribute more financing. Well, if you involve them, they will be more involved in, uh, in, in the governance process by paying more taxes, et cetera. And we have seen that. Uh, and this is the evidence beat that I was talking about in the beginning. Next slide, please. Um, again, um, um, I know that somebody will talk about Brazil example, but this is this is one of the, uh, the for budget uh, formulation empowering citizen. Uh, this is something that we have tr we have also tried to do. Um, um, in here, it's basically government just didn't have that experience of how to manage large amount of development funds. So there was this voting period. This is where you are actually empowering them. There are public meetings. And as you can see, it's, it's a difficult process. You have to be at it. It's not just one public meeting. As you, and I purposefully put on these numbers just to show that if you, if you really want to empower people and involve in this process it's a big it's a tenuous process it takes a lot of effort like 14 public meeting uh, there are 615 participants 377 ideas were submitted some proposals were accepted and then there were public voting so this was the process they followed as you can imagine to organize this the amount of effort that's needed but none, and that's what we are looking for um, in, in uh, that's what meaningful public participation uh, might look like next slide please Uh, now we are into phase three, which is budget enactment. Here, actually, Parliament is act in the uh, in the uh, leader seat. Parliament, as an institution, they are uh, asking for citizen feedback, and we have seen some in ma many parts of the world. Parliamentary committees um, they, they are inviting civil society and experts to comment on some of their thematic areas when they are these committees when they are scrutinizing uh, the budget. Um, in, in South Africa, it's been happening uh, for some time now. And then there is this very interesting mechanism that we want to highlight is par parliamentary budget offices. Uh, across the world, there are many, I know Canada, Canadians, uh, PBO was very, when I, a few years back when I attended gift meeting, they also presented and we, we at the bank has been working with them for a long time now. Um, um, we, and then 
then d definitely in, in Kenya, Uganda, they are also doing very well. Um, um, in some of the East, East Asian countries, it's actually um, helping parliamentarians on how to analyze these very technical budget proposals, and help. And when they are, um, and and when they are putting those documents in the public domain, that's also helping some of the think tanks, some of the CSOs, to pick up from there and use that disaggregated data, use that analysis for their advocacy purposes. So if for the enact stage, I think these PBOs and parliamentary committees are a good mechanism for, for, uh, but, uh, for citizen engagement. Next slide, please. For the uh, enact for the uh, for the actual uh, implementation of budget, there are very very many mechanisms, and what we have seen um, many of these uh, good example successful example uh, are clustered around this phase. But um, procurement monitoring monitoring contract um, is also very helpful a mechanism, and um, uh, uh, open contracting partnership has been doing excellent great work on, on this area uh, here actually uh, publishing the data and information in open data formats so procurement related data tremendous work a lot of work is needed but if you can do it it's it goes such a long way and then uh, they have also published this their, their data standard and I, I believe they have their help desk etc so publishing this data uh, in a format is so important and then developing some key performance indicators data visualization and also capacity build, building capacity building of journalists capacity building of CSOs uh, to, to, to be involved in a very this very technical process of procurement monitoring also very uh, very important. Um, so, so this is the part that we have highlighted a lot, and then there were other monitoring. You, uh, uh, how government investment is actually translating into development outcomes on the ground. There are many ex examples from India, how CSOs are doing it um, to tracking that fund, um, uh, um, and the, but for that data needs to be available, that government's MIS system on the programs needs to be available. When that's available, uh, combining that secondary data with primary data at, at the service delivery point level, a lot of CSOs are doing very well in that. Next slide, please. And, and finally, that external audit. Um, I think bank has been ha has uh, started working on this few years back. Um, and uh, here we have an example from Nepal, where we uh, bank provided technical assistance to OAGN uh, in first this multi stakeholder group formation, how can they partner with CSOs, because uh, uh, what is the legality behind it. Um, and then um, um, uh, it, again, audit is a very technical process, and I see that Jay uh, from PSAM is uh, online. They have done very, very good work in, in some of these areas as well. Um, how their reports, uh, uh, the work that they have done, how CSOs have picked it up uh, in South Africa. Um, uh, but, but here, I have listed down some of the steps, but what I want to quickly highlight here is um, the, from our experience, how South-South knowledge exchange, when, when we go and talk to some of these policymakers and when they say, um, uh, when we say that um, so, uh, Supreme Audit Institution should engage with citizen, th that works, but when um, uh, the super, COA, uh, Commission on Audit in Philippines, when she is through a video conference call talking to her counterpart in, uh, in Nepal, when she is saying, I have done it, these are some of the challenges, but these are some of the benefits, and I have done it, um, it, it works in my country. So um, we, we fi find that this one country talking about the challenges, the mechanisms, etc., cetera, and, and inviting others, that, that helps tremendously. So um, having those guidance, the manual, 
uh, how a little bit hand holding for OAGN because how how they can involve CSOs in doing their performance audit uh, because these government schemes are getting uh, co complicated uh, day by day. They need the reach is also increasing. Uh, OAG is maybe their strength, their manpower is not increasing uh, that quickly. So can they leverage those CSO network and help the, and 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 uh, work with them to do that data collection for performance audit? So, uh, so that, that's one of the things that we uh, external auditors are doing in few countries uh, to, to partner with CSOs. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some broad trends that we are seeing, just we want to quickly highlight, uh, moving beyond transparency. I think the, the point that uh, just publishing the data in a PDA format is not citizen engagement, uh, but this is just transparency is the foundation. So that distinction between uh, uh, transparency and and uh, public participation i feel that through efforts of many 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 organization working in this field that that has been established now and then in what we have also seen is that inclusive budget literacy matters that building that capacity raising awareness um, just putting those information or you just asking for people to come and participate doesn't work that much uh, um, it's a technical process uh, it, it, themes are technical so um, so uh, investing in that building that capacity that awareness among uh, think tank CSOs on um, it, it's it's key and then prioritize and sequence where you are in this chain and how ready are you and what you can do uh, in there also there are two broad things we can see that engage with the general public of our governments or engage with small selected specialized groups uh, and get in-depth feedback both of them are um, prevalent but i think these are two things that policymakers can first think of and and accordingly can find out the the entry points um, these two approaches are complementary uh, to gain legitimacy and um, then you identify what are some of your un, uh, entry points prioritize and how much uh, funding you are available because these things quickly can cost a lot of money um, so your country, based on your country context, what do you want to do? Where are you in this entire chain? And then what should be your entry points? Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now that um, this, this is uh, this is such a prevalent topic in discussion, we also wanted to see that how uh, government have started publishing um, uh, data on their COVID-19 uh, uh, emergency plan. What are, where are they? Uh, where are they uh, spending their money? So uh, I picked up Philippines and Brazil. Uh, it's very disaggregated level data, and um, CSO, CSOs are, are, can very well pick up at this stage uh, that this is the budget transparency this is what they have published and pick up from there and do some um, uh, uh, monitoring whether this is going uh, where they are going but again with this uh, the big caveat is then it's in the, in today's world then technology becomes so important and whether that's a hindrance whether that will uh, create again some kind of, kind of uh, uh, barrier uh, uh, because the technology technology will whether that will available to all kind of CSOs um, uh, what is the bandwidth what their internet access hope this doesn't also create some kind of um, uh, barrier for some of the CSOs to actually participate in, in this kind of monitoring activities uh, I'll, I'll think I'll stop there and then the, uh, really looking forward to some of this discussion and, uh, and uh, discussing some of the points with you Gal. Thank you very much. That was uh, a wealth of information for all of us to digest. Um, I think particularly important was you saying that the initiatives not only need to come from government, but they can come from civil society organisations themselves. Um, and then later today, we'll see when the countries are presenting back that we've got a representative from government and a representative from civil society. Um, because uh, reaching these initiatives requires a collaborative effort. 
with um, can we can now take a few minutes to ask some questions on that very interesting presentation. Um, so if anyone has got any questions, if you can raise your hand or indicate from the chat, um, is there anyone? I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Sruti, for your presentation um, and for sharing with us um, a long uh, and sustained effort from the World Bank to uh, push this agenda in different uh, sectors of intervention, but now particularly in the PFM community. And the question goes there. Um, we find frequently big resistance among ministries of finance, and I know some of them are represented here, and they are our champions, but sometimes these champions find resistance within their own ministries. And I know that you also find some areas at the World Bank that do not believe that much in, in this. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, how is that process in the World Bank uh, and, and how this topic has been gaining force in this discussion? Um, thanks, Juan Pablo. And then I see another question on the which stage of budget process is most uh, practical. Uh, Juan Pablo, we are, we are the, um, uh, what do you call it, comrade in this journey. So we, we know the, the process. But um, as you will also see uh, that um, it's, it's gaining momentum. Uh, the first question that we see from uh, from our TTLs um, within the bank that it's um, it's it, uh, it's incredibly complex. Uh, it takes time. Uh, it takes funding. Whether and from the, from the bank side, since we are primarily lending organization, the problem is whether the government would actually try to uh, borrow money for this kind of activities. So this is something. This is some of the initial um, uh, initial res, uh, um, reaction, and also then how to do it. That's what uh, it's, it's practical question that how to do it. That's why I think that this sequencing bit. Uh, for, for, for the bank team to understand where the, uh, where the country is and suggesting some of these entry points. And that's the reason we have had this series of notes, uh, um, and this is part of that note, that raising awareness among even our uh, uh, task team leaders, that uh, identifying where the countries are and what there is this just informed consult um, etc. So that's something that I, I, we feel that helping them with these kind of information goes a long way. There is genuinely this lack of uh, uh, knowledge uh, that uh, what are some of the mechanisms. Another one we are that's something we really want to focus on. And when we were presenting in the, this paper within the bank, the evidence that question comes back whether this work. Um, I, I, uh, very recently in Indonesia, there is an RCT that has been done. And if, you, if your audience is interested, I can share with Raquel and you uh, the, the uh, paper. Um, we, ha we are following that RCT work very, uh, uh, very um, uh, religiously because it's, uh, I know that uh, at times that, uh, uh, that that evidence is what it takes to involve them. And then it's not anecdotal evidence. Um, that's something that we need to really, as a community, as professional that we are, uh, we are uh, working in this field, excited about this field, I think we need to involve more. Um, uh, uh, prudence, I think um, what stage of the budget process is practical? Um, 
I feel if there is no silver bullet, I'm sure everybody has said that to, to you when you ask that question. It's basically depending on the context, the, um, which country that you were talking about, how your policy makers are, uh, where are they? Sometimes we find champions from the World Bank side, sometimes we find champions in the Supreme Audit Institution. Um, uh, they, they, they really want to, uh, th th that accountability part that they have, uh, and they were not able to do that. They couldn't hold their uh, government to account and they needed to participate, uh, they needed to involve citizen. At times it's the monitoring part because the information is there, but what are they doing with that information? But, so implementation of monitoring uh, some of the service delivery items, that whether the education sector budget, uh, whether the money is actually reaching the school. If you can uh, f follow that money for that, some of the, uh, there needs to be some uh, openness, there needs to be some right to information act or some basic information needs to be present. You need to have funding uh, to mobilize enumerators and surveyors to actually go and check. Uh, so it's um, a pets kind of thing, but there are so many simplified versions these days. Um, so uh, depending on your context. And I hope if you go to, the, uh, uh, go, go to this note and you see that what stage the country that you are interested in, uh, what stage they are and then from there. Depending on what stage they are, there are so many practical ways, so many different ways to do it. And Jay, uh, oh, the, 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 Raquel, I can't hear you. Uh, are you muted? Oh, yeah, so Jay was asking about the champions, but I think you've touched on that already. I don't know if you want to add more or if we can. Thank you very much for your very useful presentation. Um, we will hear from you again um, tomorrow. So if there are any further questions overnight, uh, perhaps read the paper uh, and then tomorrow we'll have further questions for you. Um, thank you. If we can move on to the rich Brazilian experience. Um, Daniel, Avelino, over to you. Thank you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Good evening for everyone. Is it okay if I share my own screen here? Presentation? Yes, certainly. Yes, thank you. Okay, so just in a moment. I may say this is a children walking zone, so don't be scared if they just jump over. Hello, people. It's, uh, it's a huge honor to be here and again share with you some uh, thoughts on the Brazilian experience regarding public participation. My main goal here is to share with you a brief overview of Brazilian scenario, to talk a little bit about some cases and also share some lessons learned. Brazil has a couple of uh, good experiences to share but I may say we have our highs and lows. And we really want to, to share with you some of, our, of the lessons that we learned, not only from the successes, but also from our mistakes in order for you to try to avoid that. Briefly, when we talk about public participation, it's very important to remark that we are talking about a human right participation comes from this article from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to take part in the government of his country, hence part participation. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, not only the implementation of a basic human right, but also we are talking about guaranteeing maybe perhaps the most important political right that human beings have currently. We came a long way to where we are now and uh, I really want to uh, uh, take a brief testimony on Brazilian political situation since the 60s. On 60s and 90s we, as you may know, we were under a dictatorship 
government was closed for civil society influence, but on the other hand, civil society were really active and develop a lot of uh, self-organizing actives and initiatives in order to keep the, 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 the political debate going on despite of the government repression. In the 80s, all of this uh, came together to the uh, elaboration and enactment of our constitution. Our current constitution was enacted in 88 and uh, it was uh, very successful into absorb a lot of public participation principles into the constitutional laws. Uh, in the 90s, all of this was put into question by governments focused mainly on economic issues. And by that, a lot of effort to uh, implement the ideas of public participation were postponed. Despite of this, in key areas such as health, education and social assistance, uh, civil society was uh, very successful in uh, putting together a lot of mechanisms that resisted over time to implement public participation. In the 2000 years, uh, these specific sectoral experiences expanded and spread all over the government is, as we say, the age of conferences in Brazil. We will get back to that in a minute. And a lot of specific public policies started to replicate the public uh, participation mechanisms that were developed the decade before. In 2010s, in the following decade, uh, a lot of effort was put together trying to articulate and to bring up the scale of the, those participation processes. But at the same time, a huge political crisis uh, turned the tides on the other direction. And currently, Brazil is um, facing the dismantling of a lot of public participation initiatives. And our colleague Carmela from INESC has shown you uh, the, the, the scenario uh, on Monday. And we are trying to figure out what's going to emerge from these ruptures. At the same time, a lot of initiatives uh, involving digital democracy, digital participation or e-participation was strengthened in this period. And who knows what the next decade is, uh, is held for us. Let me share with you a few cases of public participation in Brazil, the cases that I reg regard as the most uh, resilient ones and maybe could, uh, could work as a good inspiration. First of all, probably the, the, the most known case of public participation in Brazil is the participatory budgeting. It's basically a very uh, intensive consultative process uh, taken by the executive branch and involving the, 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 uh, the community, the local community as a whole. In practice, uh, people are uh, invited to take part in local assemblies and also thematic assemblies, which uh, are uh, interested with the idea of prioritizing the needs of population. All of those contributions are put together by a forum of representatives and later by a council of participatory budgeting. And this results in an uh, investment plan which composes the basis of uh, local budgetary laws. There's a lot of variation in the methods of participatory budgeting, including a lot of uh, initiatives involving digital uh, channels. But the main idea here is people can prioritize their own needs and government can take that into consideration when formulating the budgetary laws. Moving on, councils are another uh, very interesting experience. Different from uh, participatory budgeting, councils are permanent bodies inside the executive branch. They are created as a public uh, uh, agency, but composed by representatives of governmental and non-governmental organizations. 
that said, it's really interesting to see that as the councils are permanent bodies, they also uh, work as a, as, a, as a place for competence building, capacity building. People who take a seat on a national council in Brazil usually uh, are immersed in a very intensive process of learning and they, in a short amount of time, can be uh, regarded as experts on that specific issue. Also, as the council is uh, formally located inside the, the public administration, inside the government, they are very good uh, actors to perform oversight functions as well as monitoring functions. They don't need to wait for, uh, for the government to share information. They just can walk the, the next door and take it by themselves. So putting together this kind of uh, permanent bodies is a way to make public participation more sustainable and also more embedded into the governmental structures. Here is uh, uh, an example in the area of uh, health policies. We have our National Council of Health. Government representatives are minority in this specific council, but they are backed, they are supported by a huge network of state councils and local councils. As you may see, more than 5,000 local councils existing in Brazil, which uh, put together a, 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 a very intensive network of sharing, peer learning, and also advocacy and mutual support in order to uh, foster yeah, one, one step further into a more democratic management of policies. Besides that, we also have national conferences. National conferences are periodic consultative processes, but different from public consultation or public audiences. National conferences are organized in a very specific territorial manner. Uh, they intend to cover the entirety of the national territory, which means that they are organized in a federated, in a hierarchical way of consulting. In practices, uh, cities are invited to organize municipal local conferences. Those conferences uh, bring up representatives and proposals, which are reunited in state conferences. And those state conferences also provide representatives and proposals to a huge, big, comprehensive uh, national stage of the conferences, of the specific conferences. Just an example here from the latest conference on health, we had more than 5,000 of municipal conferences organized, which means uh, more than 80% of national territory covered. We, we had achieved better results than that. Uh, all the states organized state conferences and on the national conference last year, uh, more than 2,000 participants were meeting in order to uh, prioritize the, 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 the main guidelines for the national policy of health. Um, these national conferences are really interesting because they bring up the idea of uh, regional inequalities into the debate. We know that uh, some public consultations tend to be highly biased towards a specific city or a specific region in the country. So when we organize a national uh, set of consultations, we can just visualize, we can see more clearly how the different territories think differently about the same policy. And a recent example, the idea of the national system of hearing offices. Uh, uh, through an integrated platform of ombudsman. Our national ombudsman office was trying to organize since 2015, an integrated network of the hearing offices in the public administration. This works mainly through digital initiatives, 
uh, making good use of uh, internet for interaction, but also for sharing information. It's heavily based on the open government and open that data principles. But the main issue here, the, the, the key question is how of those uh, contributions, demands and manifestations from people are organized to become inputs in terms of public participation. And the idea uh, from the National System of Hearing Office is to take uh, consideration of, uh, of each demand, which is individually presented by people interested in, in requiring information or complaining about services. And all of this is uh, compiled into management reports, which on their part are discussed internally with the managers of the specific public policy. The main characteristic here of this kind of network of interaction, network of public participation, is that differently from the previous examples that I share with you, this one is heavily individual based, which means any person can make use of this network, regardless of invitation, regardless of representation, regardless of the intermediation of any civil society in the, uh, organization. This brings a new perspective from a participatory system, which was organized in terms of community and uh, civil society organizations previously. This probably makes different publics, different groups of people to have access to this uh, kind of civil society state interaction. Here are some numbers. We have more than 1 million demands registered until now, 60% of resolution. It's not a, a, high, a high rate. And uh, an average of 24 days for a public answer to each demand. Now, I uh, want to share with you a few lessons that we learned along the way and mostly in the hard way. First of all, to uh, engage on a successful public participation initiative, it's really important to connect it to a public decision. Participation and decision are the two sides of the same coin which means that uh, public participation initiative or public participation mechanisms, which, which uh, lacks this kind of clear connection with the public decisions, tends to be not only ineffective, but also unattractive for people to engage on. Uh, a clear connection between a public participation and a future public decision, so it's a very clear requirement in order to make all of those things work well. It's connected with the principles of informed participation, uh, represented on the second and the sixth gift principles of public participation. But I also want to remind you that participation involves, <coughs> sorry, a huge investment, not only of public resources, but also an investment of time, an investment of effort, an investment of uh, expectations and hope for all people involved on that. So in order to make it fair, in order to make it uh, uh, a process of informed participation, a clear connection to a future public decision must be explicit from the first time. Also, uh, second advice always consider existing initiatives. It was interesting because Surti just said that in the previous uh, presentation, context matters, context always matters. Civil society is not a static group of people. They are actively developing solutions for their needs and for their problems. And those solutions and those initiatives already exist in civil society uh, as a whole should be taken into consideration if you want to build trust digital culture is ignored 
they can generate concurrence and legitimacy disputes, which means uh, it seems to be breaking out, Daniel. Uh, oops, sorry. It seems that your audio is breaking up a little bit. Oh, so we're not hearing okay. very clearly. Um, maybe, maybe it's better right now if we stop my video, okay? Yeah, and if yeah, you try to wrap it up, please. Thank you. Okay, and uh, just coming to an end, right here, another key issue is trying to compensate inequalities. Uh, a public participation processes uh, should not ex be expected to be neutral and should not pretend to be neutral. Uh, a lot of groups already have uh, privileged access to public decision and in order to compensate for that, public participation processes should engage into inclusiveness, into the involvement of specific disadvantaged group of people. And uh, institutionalize as soon as possible. Innovation, uh, starting as a innovation is okay, but remain as innovation means that, that uh, some initiatives can be easily destroyed as the government changes. So the goal here is trying to put those public policies initiatives as deep as possible into the legal framework of some country. And for that, maybe sometimes bureaucracy can help as a factor of resilience. Finally, don't forget to monitor and evaluate each of uh, the steps taken into the way. How else can you know if you did it right? Uh, take into consideration tangible and also intangible results of each process and remind that, uh, bear in mind that attendance or public support still is the best indicator of success of any public uh, participation initiative. In the uh, GIFT website, we can find a lot of cases that can be used as a benchmark or as, or as a inspiration including Brazilian case. And I finish uh, here uh, just hoping that we can talk a little bit more about some specificities of these cases and wishing a healthy and uh, productive conversation for you all. Thank you so much. Muito obrigado, Daniel. Um, are there any very pressing questions at this point in time? Or can we move on? There's also space that you could put your questions on the chat function uh, because Daniel will be joining us again tomorrow um, and then you'd be able to incorporate that perhaps into tomorrow's presentation. Okay, I don't see any uh, pressing questions. So I think if we can uh, please move on to Sierra Leone. Um, it would be great to hear the example from there. So Abu Bakar and Matthew Dinghy, um, can you please take it away? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, are you seeing my slide on your side? Um, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. And um, I'll be presenting for five minutes, and then Matthew Dingy will also make a comment on the, the presentation. Um, the, firstly, in, in our context in Sweden, this whole process started around 2005, when the Government Budgeting Accountability Act was actually um, um, enacted. So the Act makes provision for uh, citizens to participate in the uh, budget process. And uh, along with the act, again, the medium term expenditure framework was also developed, which spells out how government should spend and plan for the next um, um, three years. And again, in that medium term expenditure framework, uh, uh, citizen participation in policy and budget discussion was also a factor, and it, it also includes what is expected of them. So, even in addition to that, um, you know, before the 
actual preparation of budget starts. The Ministry of Finance will do the budget call circular to all the respective ministry department agencies, guiding them in terms of what to do um, in preparing the budget. And even in that um, memo again, the issue of how um, 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 MDA is ensuring that um, the engaged citizens prior to their plan it was also um, um, a factor. So uh, uh, fast forward in 2016, the Public Financial Management Act was um, developed and its regulation which replaced the Government Budgeting and uh, Accountability um, um, Act. And of course, of course, again, we saw in that act more um, space being provided for citizens to participate in the budget um, um, discussion process. And along that, again, the medium term expenditure framework was also um, revised. And of course, the medium term expenditure also emphasized the aspect of the ministries to do what they call pre budget discussion with CSOs um, working around their area of interest so that. I would think the, the respective ministry, there are already some discussion, there are already some citizen participation in their budget uh, preparation prior to coming to the main budget discussion. And again, the budget cost cycle again, of course, now make it mandatory that um, ministries should invite other stakeholders in the preparation of their internal budget before they take it out to the uh, general public for more um, discussion. So the whole idea around this was to give citizens an opportunity to express their view on the budget proposal, development initiative, and service delivery. And all of this is geared towards ensuring that um, citizen idea suggestions are actually taken on board into the national budget. Though not all of them, but uh, um, to see that at least some of them are actually taken on board in the national uh, uh, um, budget. So, um, for us, in doing all of this, one of the things that gave us the, our ending point is because we have a legal and regulatory framework that make it mandatory for citizens to participate in the budget discussion and policy hearing um, um, process. So because we have that legal and regulatory framework, then it's now uh, uh, upon the Minister of Finance to ensure that citizens are informed prior to the budget discussion process in terms of what they expected of them what they expect the respective MDAs to do in terms of accommodating citizens' um, participation. So in doing this, they mean in, our, in our own case, um, radio and TV announcements were made like, like, like a week before even the discussion uh, um, starts itself. And um, uh, for us again in Sierra Leone, the good thing is we have a group of CSOs focusing more on PFM issues. So they serve as a focal point to coordinate other CSOs that are now working on PFM issues to see how they can bring their issues geared towards that issues that have to do with um, government budget taking on board, how they can ensure that those issues are actually captured by the respective ministries and factored into their um, um, budgets. So all of these are key issues for our um, entry point. So for us, before the budget discussion, there will be like um, a day or a two um, that is stated for the policy hearing. The policy hearing mainly looking at high level policies in terms of what government intend to do the, 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 um, the following year. And again, that space is open. It's also providing an opportunity. I remember like when, um, like three or four years back, we are even given the space for us to do our presentation on how we feel about the previous uh, budget, about the previous policies. So that space has been provided and we saw in some instances where some of the issues were captured by, by the minister. And it, it's also captured even how to improve the participation itself. Because it's not just um, people come to sit and listen, but how to ensure that the participation are actually meaningful enough. And those participation are actually taken on board. Uh, some of them are taken on board by the respective ministry department and agencies. So that hearings, policy hearing, provide a platform for us to discuss all of these issues. In the past, it just focused on the ministries, but now we have now seen state-owned enterprises, parastators, and local council are now part of this whole discussion at that policy um, um, level. And then from the uh, policy hearing, then a whole two or three weeks is now being slated 
for the bilateral budget discussion with respective ministry departments and, and agencies. And we now see state-owned enterprises, local council, power state, and not part of the discussion. Initially, they were not part of the whole process in terms of discussing their budget and what they intend uh, um, to do. One, one good thing around this process is that the meeting is open to all. Everybody can attend. So therefore, a whole range of opinion people, even those marginalized groups, have the opportunity to participate. For example, the HIV group, the women's farmers, youth group, and um, the CSOs. So what the CSO forum and PFM normally do is, they create a link between this vulnerable group and the respective ministry department and agencies. So normally there is now that bilateral discussion for us at that ministerial level. For example, it has to do with HIV issues. The HIV people deal with themselves with catalog the issues where they want to see the budget factor and engage the ministry directly prior to the budget discussion. So the budget discussion will not just have as a platform to re-engage and see how far the ministry have captured those issues would they have would they have early had discussion um, on. So that has helped in a way that we now see some of these marginalized group issues are now being factored um, 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 in, into the budget. So this budget discussion, um, of course, is a series of meetings focusing state-owned enterprises, ministries, departments, and agencies, power status. And the good thing is, it's not just discussing what they want to do in the previous years. It provides an opportunity for the MDAs to report on what has been done the previous years, to what extent they have achieved that deliverable, to what, what are the challenges. The, the, the good thing around this is that we have CSOs all around the country working around various issues. So it's also a platform for them to confirm or challenge those issues that have been provided by uh, the uh, uh, um, ministries. There was a, an example like almost like uh, five, five years back we are in, um, the Ministry of Works was presenting uh, on issues around uh, renovations of uh, government quarters. And interestingly enough, one of the staff of that particular quarter was there. So you have to challenge the extent to the renovation that has been done. So that platform provide all that uh, um, 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 place for citizens to challenge or confirm or definitely ensure that what is being presented is actually a reality on the ground. It also provides an opportunity for citizens to suggest issues which they want to see factored in the budget. And we have seen examples where in new ideas that were brought as part of the budget discussion were factored into the final budget and were costed. For example, the, um, the Ministry of under the Ministry of Agriculture, they have an agency called SLARI, Stalin Institute of Agriculture Research. During that budget presentation, a member from the, from the uh, uh, civil society made a brilliant suggestion that onion, we are investing, we are spending a lot of resources on onion in Sierra Leone. So therefore, there is a need for that institution to conduct a, the economic, a study on economic viability of onion. And it was a very brilliant idea. And all of the participants in that meeting took the idea. And that idea was costed and was factored into the budget. So these are just examples in, um, example where in issues that were not part of the MDS budget, but because of the citizen participation to this process, they were captured and provided and, and budgeted for in the, um, in the budget. Of course, um, this presentation also make provisions for uh, the public to ask questions, to make observations, and to participate in the discussion. And also, even in terms of the policies, it also makes, because in some instances, policies in terms of how they want to address certain issues were presented. So this forum make provision for us to make input into that particular um, um, process. But in, in all of this, we still face some um, challenges. One of them has to do with limited information being shared prior to the meeting. You know, just imagine like, for example, the Minister of Health, they have like over 14 um, divisions and all of those information are given to us at the doorstep of the discussion. So it's making it difficult for us to digest those issues and make meaningful um, contribution. The other challenge we faced was um, limited feedback. 
to, uh, in terms of how input are actually being um, used. We agree there are a few cases where in what citizen propose we actually see in the budget. But generally, we do not have that feedback mechanism that will say, these are all the issues that we are generated by the citizens during the participation of this budget discussion. Based on the reason A, B, and C, these are the issues that we are captured. These are the issues that are not captured, and these are the reason. So we have challenging to have that kind of um, um, adequate um, feedback. Of course, again, the capacity of majority of CSOs in Sierra Leone to critically engage um, MDAs on technical issues. So again, that face, uh, that again pose another challenge uh, to us here in, in Sierra Leone. So all of this one, what we have learned was that um, when citizens participate in you know, our discussion, in our case, it helps to the agenda of government in terms of um, service delivery. And of course, it serves as a platform for us to actually bring out issues that were neglected by respective MDs. So it provides a platform for those issues to be captured and budgeted for. In other words, it provides a platform for marginalized voice to be had in terms of providing budgetary allocation um, um, for them. Of course, in Sierra Leone, one of the things that help us is that we have formidable group that are working around the public financial management issues. So they support in terms of mobilizing other groups that are not working around PFM, but has something to do with budget allocation. So they help in terms of mobilizing them and see how they can increase their interest in the budgetary uh, participation in Sierra Leone. So um, going forward, I think for countries that do not have a legal reg regulatory framework, it is good for them to actually develop one to ensure that citizen participation in the budget process is actually guaranteed. So it's not be like a favor that when the Minister of Finance feel they, they call you, but if we have a legal or regulatory framework that will guide the Minister of Finance on how they go about this process, then that will help in terms of providing um, um, this, this space. And of course, CSOs need to constantly follow up on the process, the timeline, and ensure that government adhere to what the regulatory framework around citizen participation in the, in the budget process is. For example, if the budget process like is supposed to come out in June and it's not out in June, citizens should follow up with the ministries to ensure that they adhere to some of those um, timelines. Time so by doing that, the ministry will know that there are people watching and following what they are doing. So therefore, they need to adhere. And of course, the Minister of Finance should take the leadership to create space in this particular uh, process to ensure that, and because this will bring the aspect of legitimacy and, and citizens will own the budget as their own idea. So I will stop here and then uh, Matthew Dingy will now add on to my presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Kamala. Um, good morning or good afternoon to all participants. Um, I'm happy to join the discussion and thanks for the invitation. Um, I don't want to go much again into the um, issues that have been presented by Abubakar because they are quite clear in terms of what we have done to improve citizens' participation in the budget process. Um, just a brief introduction again. I'm Matthew Dinge. I'm the Principal Deputy Financial Secretary in the Ministry of Finance. Well, prior to this, my current position, um, which I started in 2018, I've been the Director of Budgets for the past 13 years prior to that. So most of the reforms um, my colleague was um, um, referring to, I actually pioneered those reforms get those um, legislations through in terms of our acts and regulations to make sure that these processes are not subject to um, obje and, and subjective decisions by individuals, but for us as a country to actually adopt them and make them part of our um, budget process. So we saw the need, especially immediately after the war, to um, improve on the transparency of our budget process. Um, you could recall, Sierra Leone went through a brutal civil war for about 10 or so years. 
And at the end of the world, one of the reasons why citizens were not happy is the way in which um, the national resource is being distributed to all citizens in the country. So we saw the need in making the reforms to get um, the public or the general citizenry to participate in the budget discussions that we hold every year. So we clearly understood from our experience over the years that citizens don't actually understand the functions of the various line ministries, departments, and agencies. Sorry, Raquel. Of them. We need to improve that. That. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, the interpretation in Spanish cannot uh, continue because um, uh, although we hear you in English, your voice is so low. So uh, uh, I was wondering if you could get closer to the microphone or speak a little bit louder. Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting, but we want our speaking, our Spanish speaking uh, uh, participants to also get your, your experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, it's raining heavily here in Freetown. So I'm sure it's the noise from the rain. That's why they are not getting me clearly. Is it, am I audible now? Am I audible? Yes. Now that you're speaking louder, it's much better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So as I was saying, um, we actually observed that citizens do not actually know the functions of the line ministries, departments, and agencies in terms of what is expected of them to deliver every year. So they had lost interest even in the entire budget process. And when the budget is approved, or even the various stages that the budget had to go through before it becomes a law. So one way we had to um, um, build up on that is to improve on the transparency and bring in the citizenry participation. So what we have done over the years, we have even provided both financial and technical support to civil society organizations like BAN and the rest, non-state actors, district budget oversight committees, which we, are, which we have established and also by law, for them to take part in the open budget hearings and budget discussions that we do every year when we are putting the government budgets together. Now, it is not only at the point where the budget is being discussed that these citizens or the public take part. Even in the monitoring and the implementation of the government budget, they also take part. So they send quarterly reports to the Ministry of Finance and tell us about decisions which we are taking during the budget hearings and how those decisions in terms of policy programs or projects are being implemented in their various localities. So we receive those reports, we'll review those reports, and then we'll contact the relevant ministry, department, or agency that is implementing that program or project and draw to their attention the concerns that have been raised by citizens on the progress with which that project or program is being implemented. If there are challenges, what are their challenges? If the work or the project that is being done is below standard, and what should be done to make sure that it is done properly and within time, so that at least the people can benefit from the um, project or program that is being implemented. One great benefit we have got from the open participation of our budget is especially on the social sector. Like Abu Bakr has mentioned, for health and education, we've recorded tremendous success in terms of the input we've got from citizens to shape the discussions on how we determine the budget for the education sector and even for the health sector. In Sierra Leone, we now have a free education program, free quality education program, and a free primary health care program. So for this program to succeed, we've got a lot of input from civil society, from non-state actors, from district budget oversight committees, from other um, stakeholders in the budget process that have helped government to shape these programs to make sure that the pupils or the patients in the various hospitals are getting the regular supplies, whether it is for provision of textbooks, teaching and learning materials, whether for, to monitor the punctuality of teachers, 
or health workers in the various facilities, the provision of drugs, medical supplies to hospitals, making sure because the citizens now know as part of the budget process what the government has approved to be provided in terms of services or goods to these localities or to the facilities that we provide them to the public. So this has really helped us over the years to strengthen the participation. And every year when citizens um, come for the budget hearing, they will give us feedback as to what they learned in the previous year and what they think we should improve upon and how we can strengthen the process going forward. So just to lend my voice to the um, issue that we also believe in Sierra Leone, that this is a very, very important aspect of governance as it's opened the space for everyone to be involved in decision making as to how the resources of the country is to be allocated and how it's to be efficiently managed and how it's to be reported on for the benefit of the general citizenry so that it creates, um, we can clarify a lot of doubt I mean, in the minds of the populace as to what the government is actually doing. So almost every week, every month or so, we issue out reports for the information of the public as to what government is doing in terms of implementation of basic service delivery in these various sectors. So I thank you all for the opportunity and I hope we we'll continue on the debates and to whatever input you need or clarification from Sierra Leone, we still stand ready to provide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew and Abu Bakar. That was a very interesting example from uh, Sierra Leone. Um, given in the interest of time, I think we've got one question. If we could just perhaps answer that quickly. Um, so the question is from Prudence, um, and she's asking, uh, how do you manage expectations of citizens considering low revenue expectations? And how do you deal with low budget literacy? Um, so if you could give a quick answer, Abu Bakar, or if you want to answer tomorrow, that would also be appropriate. Uh, perhaps you can just give us a quick indication. Thank you. Probably I'll focus on the one on low budget um, literacy. No, as part of our program, we are doing um, during the budget discussion process, for example, every day after the budget discussion, we will go into the key radio, in fact, the simulcast, like TV radio, we continue to work as state, and explain in our own native language for citizens to understand what has been presented, what has been spent, and how they, and what is expected for the respective ministries for the um, 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 following year. Because we knew that not everybody would be there at that meeting. So therefore, we normally have that program explaining in Kivu, and then it also provides an opportunity for those not at the program to send their own comment in terms of what they want to see. So what we what we did for almost all the years, what we are continuing to do is we catalog all of these issues and present it to the Ministry of Finance in terms of this is what the citizens say that those outside the budget discussion in terms of what they want to see in the following budget year. So there are some attempts in terms of making sure that we um, um, get citizens to understand the services which the budget intend to provide from the civil society perspective. And just to add on to that, on the expectations of um, the citizens uh, because of the low revenue um, situation, especially in Sierra Leone, what we do, we send out ceilings along with the budget call circular to various line ministry departments and agencies. And during the budget presentations, we, we um, encourage the ministries to show how much are they expected to get from the budget against the ceiling that was given to them to prepare the budget. So it's interesting at that point, the reaction we get from the citizenry to see the, the wide gap in terms of variance between what the ministry wants and what the ceiling is saying in terms of resource availability. So even at that stage, we encourage citizens to know that we are operating within scarce resources and so we have to make uh, rational decisions as to what we think should be the priorities and how that will be handled in the context of the budget. So that really helps to um, pacify the expectations of citizens 
as to what we could achieve in any budget here based on the resources that is actually available. Thank you. Then just one quick question from Suad. She's asking, uh, to, she wants to learn about the cost and re resources dedicated to the annual exercise. Do you have specific staff, especially dedicated to the participation practice? Yes, um, that's actually part of the expenditure we incur every year. It's quite huge, but we think the benefits of doing that far outweigh the cost of doing this, this uh, public participation. It usually runs into, if I put it in dollar terms, on average, hundred to $200,000 that we spend on that every year. But the benefits we are getting from the process, and like my colleague Abla and Abu Bakr has mentioned, and the involvement of citizens in the process that has actually helped us to shape the process better, I think we, 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 we can still continue to incur that cost because we still continue to get value for money in the process itself. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank, you. thank you for your very um, insightful presentation. Now, if we can please move along to the brief update uh, from countries. Uh, for each country, we've got a Ministry of Finance representative, um, as well as a CSO representative. You'll notice that in some countries, um, they have come together and they're actually doing one uh, presentation. We like that sort of collaboration and congratulate you where you've been able um, to do that. Uh, but we will give an opportunity to both speakers from government and CSOs um, to have a few words. So if we can start with Chile, we've got uh, Maya Freyal and Victoria Gubin-Smith from the Ministry of Finance. And then we've got uh, Veronica from the Comisão del Gastro Público. Um, if you can please take the floor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Raquel. Can you hear me well? <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, sometimes I've had some issues with the audio. I will share my screen as well. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Victoria. I'm here representing the Ministry of Finance of Chile. Um, unfortunately, Amaya and Veronica had um, some last minute uh, meetings and another seminar, so they had to disconnect. Um, but uh, in any case, Amaya is in charge of the modernization of state for the Ministry of Finance. And Veronica is part of our uh, Council for Public Spending, which, um, which has been working with the Ministry of Finance since January of this year. Um, in virtue of time, I'm going to try and make this uh, as short as possible. I, I just wanted to introduce um, how Chile began um, getting into public participation. Um, we uh, implemented a law in 2011, which is uh, this one, 20,500, which um, it gives citizens the possibility of becoming a part of the decision-making process through four different mechanisms. Today, I will share uh, one with you, the one that I think is most uh, noteworthy. Um, the Civil Society Council is, is the most effective mechanism. Um, since it brings a group of members from different nonprofit organizations into the confidence of the authorities, uh, in this case, it can be a director or a minister, to discuss um, different issues, uh, programs that that institution is, um, is moving forward, uh, policies that it is undertaking, etc. Um, each council is formed independently and democratically by each institution. So for example, the Ministry of Health has obviously organizations that are related to um, health and science and uh, in different ministries or uh, government agencies. Their council is made up of people who work in the scope of their area. Uh, obviously this way they can make uh, <laughs> proper inputs. 
Um, in some institutions, this law has been extremely ingrained in their way of working, but in others, they're still incorporating it, incorporating it into their particular work culture. So even though this law has not been uh, implemented evenly in the government, we are um, making progress and the, there is uh, a good motivation to uh, give public participation um, importance and it has been gaining relevance over the past um, 10 years. Um, on behalf of the Ministry of Finance, um, I, I'm just I'm going to focus on a few of our initiatives, uh, especially ones that we have undertaken over the past year. Um, we have focused mainly on transparency and as Trudy mentioned in her presentation, um, this does, transparency is not the same as public participation, but as she said, it is, it is a principle and it is an important part of participation because we believe that giving people access to a relevant data is how they can uh, understand issues and be able to participate effectively. So in that sense, um, some of the initiatives that I will present to you today, uh, the first one is our open budget initiative. This is a uh, online platform where you can find detailed information about the assigned public resources and executed monthly public spending of the central government. You can see, um, you can, it's, it's an interactive platform, so you can see it in different segments, different areas. Uh, you can find it by sector, regions of the, com of the country, the main recipients or providers of the state. Um, as I mentioned, it's interactive, it's easy to navigate, and it gives anyone interested in the possibility of exploring how and where public resources are spent. Um, and it also has historical data from as of 2016, so you can go back a few years to see um, anything that you would like to look up. Uh, next, I wanted here to uh, mention that in January of this year, the Ministry of Finance created the Public Spending Council. Um, Veronica Pinilla, who is going to present with me, she is part of this council. Um, they, their objective is to work with the government, in particular the Ministry of Finance, to propose initiatives that will result in better transparency and confidence indicators. Um, this has become extremely important because in October of last year, um, we had a big social crisis in Chile. So we, we believe that this is an important step to, uh, to bring people closer to the decision-making process and also gain confidence and uh, just emphasize the importance of transparency. Um, the first, which is on the, uh, on the left, is the taxpayer report. Um, this is the first taxpayer report, or as we call it, um, a report al contribuyente. Uh, it's the first time that we have done this, and we have seen, we, we based it on a few international examples, um, like Australia, for example, issues a, a taxpayer um, receipt, they call it. Basically, um, this, this report, um, is a, personal, is a personalized report for taxpayers and it reached the email inboxes of actually 3.7 million taxpayers with a description of how their taxes were spent by the government and it's separated into different spending areas. So it shows how much you paid in income tax and sales tax and how that is distributed into, for example, education, health, et cetera. Um, I believe this is a great example of how participation can be brought into an initiative like this because it was co-designed with over 700 participants who, who, who took part in this process, who gave input, who gave ideas. Um, and it was actually, collab it was under collaboration of three different government entities. Um, in addition to the council who, who did the recommendation and on the right, we have our COVID-19 measures platform, which is um, another recommendation. This one was born from the pandemic and the need to make public spending as transparent and efficient as possible 
to meet the social needs created by the economic distress caused by uh, COVID-19. This particular website shows uh, different statistics and relevant information for the various social and economic measures taken by the government to confront the crisis. So both of these, both of, both of these initiatives try to uh, simplify the sometimes complex uh, issues that, that people face and sometimes that they don't understand. So the objective is to educate and inform um, and we believe that this is a first step, especially the taxpayer report, is a first step into bringing people closer to, uh, to the budget process and the decision-making process behind, um, behind budget planning. And uh, finally, the last initiative that I would like to highlight is um, a, the COVID-19 uh, purchases initiative where all of the purchases um, related to the pandemic and made from different providers during the pandemic when they buy pandemic related goods or services. Um, sorry, all of these purchases are earmarked by the public procurement agency and this allows us to analyze the purchasing made during the crisis and has enabled us to understand the data clearly regarding the health equipment especially and the other necessary products and services that have been um, that have been bought and sold to the state um, so this this is a power bi site uh, and without further ado i will pass on to the next person to not take up too much more of your time, but thank you so much, Raquel and Juan Pablo, for the um, opportunity to share these different initiatives with all of you, and I hope that uh, it has been a helpful input. It has been extremely helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Um, I think with that, if we can move on to South Africa, uh, where my previous colleagues uh, Prudence and Zuki are going to give us a presentation on the updates of where they are at in the um, projects that they are currently undertaking. Thank you, Zuki and Prudence. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Raquel. Um, and just to say, um, Prudence and I decided that um, because we've got, we want to be quite strict with our three minutes, um, that I would go ahead and present on, on um, our, our behalf or on South Africa's behalf. I hope everyone can see the um, first slide. Um, and um, so Prudence Scalia, who's uh, my counterpart, is um, from the um, Budget Office at the National Treasury in South Africa. And I am representing civil society. I work at the Public Service Accountability Monitor and also working with um, Imalieti, which is a coalition of civil society organizations. So we'll just give, um, we just prepared a very brief update um, on our fiscal openness accelerator um, uh, participatory uh, discussions at this point. Um, and for anyone who, who'd like uh, an update on Bulega Mali, I think um, we'd be happy to do that as well at, in, in our conversations later. So just to get right into it, um, the, I think the launch was quite an exciting one in March earlier this year. It feels like a much longer time ago than that. Um, we had our fiscal um, openness accelerator launched at uh, the offices of the National Treasury in Pretoria, uh, representing various governments. And um, you'll see in the photos, many familiar faces. The, um, at that point, what we were able to establish was, I think, quite a formidable representative group in terms of an advisory committee for the for our um, formation with uh, five civil society organizations or formations and um, government departments. We also subsequent to that discussed that we wanted to open up the circle even further because we like to be complicated. No, because of um, various discussions. And so we added to that um, representation from the um, local governments of the city of Johannesburg as a local government representative, then the Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs Department, um, which has quite an important local government um, element. And 
the, the Office of the Auditor General was also um, identified as a, as a potential advisor or additional member um, for various reasons, which we can talk about. And maybe if we have question time, we could. Um, where we are at this point, and I'm really just trying to give a synopsis, is um, following that meeting, we've had quite a, a number of very um, engaging and quite in-depth discussions. We also decided to do a little bit of a review of our terms of reference, um, which has taken us a little bit longer than we'd hoped. But I think in Tanzania, they say pole pole. So there's no rush. And I think in the end, it, it likely will benefit us um, in terms of what, what we collaboratively can do in developing our deciding on participatory mechanisms. With GIFT and IBP assistance, we've been able to identify quite a, an, an interesting platform and mayor's, mayor, mayor task, which I think most of us hadn't uh, used before. And we're hoping through that to be able to launch into some crowdsourcing and collaborative work around identifying um, appropriate mechanisms. So our next meeting is coming up quite soon. And from that meeting is where we'll really begin to get um, into the meat of our discussions. I think our country has a lot of participatory elements. And so I think it'll be really important. Um, our opportunities now are to rebuild our momentum and, and get back into the, you know, the, the groove of the work. Um, and, and I think one of the other really exciting things we've decided to do is to have quite a direct collaborative approach to setting our agenda. Um, um, so that's, that's where we, we are at at the moment. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll just stop there um, for now. Prudence, if I've left anything out, please do feel free to jump in. And just to close off, that's, that's thank you, just to encourage anyone once, once all this is done um, to come and visit us. Um, but it has, as, as we've identified, COVID-19 has added quite a significant challenge to the ways that we've been able to engage and deliberate. Um, thank you, Zuki. Um, indeed, uh, you've got beautiful South Africa there. Um, I think you should make it the background to your screen for the rest of the week, um, as it is uh, truly beautiful and we all want to visit there. Um, uh, are there any questions for Zuki or Prudence at this? Oh, you see Daniel is saying he wants your background, Zuki. So I think you need to put it quickly before it gets um, taken away from you. Um, so if there are any further questions for Zuki, Zuki and Prue will join us again tomorrow. So feel free to put it in the chat um, and then we can uh, address it tomorrow. If we can now move on to Nigeria with Dr. Anne from the Ministry of Finance and Awal from CISLAC. Um, Dr. Anne, uh, welcome, and please share your insights with us. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Anne Nzebu um, from Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning. We are now in one mega ministry. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me start by extending my profound gratitude and support that, or towards the support we've received from GIFT since we became a member. And this is as far back as December 2017. We've enjoyed a lot of uh, support, assistance all through, and we really appreciate being one of the pilot countries for public participation. Um, Zuki, I enjoyed the photo, the solidarity picture you posted because it just brought back the memories of uh, um, South Africa back. Um, so for us in Nigeria, we have um, my colleague, um, my civil society colleague, Mr. Awal, is on the line and I'll be very brief so he'll have opportunity to speak. We have only three minutes. <clears throat> but for us in Nigeria, we signed the MOU, we constituted our advisory group, and we had it inaugurated by the minister, um, and we have started to meet. Unfortunately, like everybody experienced a little setback from COVID, we experienced a little setback, although our group has been meeting not as often as we love to meet. <clears throat> 
but right now, <clears throat> the COVID atmosphere is getting better. Uh, we will continue meeting and we will um, probably start face-to-face -face meetings as well, not, not too far from now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so starting from September 1st, we intend to bring in um, a lot of people, gifts, IDP, and all those for further uh, guidance to the advisory group. And hopefully, in a short time from now, we expect to have the initiatives that Nigeria is going to do um, presented. Hello? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Please, um, my civil society counterpart, I think he's having some challenge. So he wanted to speak through my phone. So I'll oh. give him the opportunity. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Awal. Dr. Ran. Yes. Can you, you hear me? No, we cannot hear him. Dr. Ran, no. let me suggest. Let me okay. suggest that he speaks to you. He speaks to you and you tell us what he's saying. Okay, go ahead and speak to me because you're not hearing, I'll repeat it. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, they are glad to be part of this important meeting today. They are, they are working with the government as civil society to ensure that um, there's full implementation of this project. Go ahead. As designed at the, uh, in the MOU. In order to achieve the objective of the project. We've had an inauguration and we've made several um, Zoom meetings. They are hoping that as government starts is, is, is currently easing the COVID-19 um, protocols, that we will start meeting um, physically as well very soon. Okay. <clears throat> um, that they will be. They are willing to learn from other countries their experience in implementing the project so that it, um, they will get the experience of how it's done in other countries to try to replicate that in Nigeria. I, and then we will be able to share our own experience to other countries. Okay, they are looking forward to receive a comprehensive report on the deliberation, so it will serve as an information tool for the civil society in Nigeria as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry for the mess up with him getting on board, but he'll join us tomorrow. <coughs> Right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I believe uh, we're almost running out of time, but we are able to extend the session by a few minutes so that we can have our important breakout rooms where we engage with each other. Um, Liberia is not in the room at the moment, um, unless I haven't seen them, but I don't believe they are. So I think um, hopefully they will join us tomorrow together with uh, Senegal and Benin that are French-speaking countries. 
Um, so with that, if we can um, uh, move into our breakout rooms um, and uh, perhaps we take a, a one minute break so that we can just organize the breakout rooms. But essentially, the um, questions there are going to be um, what are the challenges being faced? Uh, by your country on initiating public participation initiatives? Are there challenges being faced in identifying the objectives or why you are actually undertaking this uh, initiative to start off with? Or are you facing challenges in identifying and planning for interventions? Um, and then it could be great in, if in each of our groups we brainstorm peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer on what are the lessons that we can learn from each other as well as if we have ideas that we can share with our colleagues on the way to overcome these challenges. Um, we will have about 15 minutes um, to have these discussions um, so feel free to have an open discussion with colleagues and come up with ideas on how to overcome um, these challenges. Um, Albertina will uh, split us into groups now. Um, thank you very much. Um, after that, the session uh, will come to an end. Um, the next session is in about an hour and it's on accountability in COVID-19 on resistant fiscal transparency um, for emergencies. Uh, we do hope that you'll be able to um, join us then too. Uh, but in the meantime, let's have robust, dynamic conversations in these breakout rooms. Thank you.